This is Atheist Lowdown with Mark Vandebrink. Hello and welcome to the Lowdown. I'm here in beautiful Vicksburg, Mississippi, on our way to the Reason Rally, and I'll be speaking with Neil Carter about his blog, Godless in Dixie. Neil and I met at a casino overlooking the Mississippi River. You describe yourself as growing up as a evangelical Christian. Yes. Uh, could you tell us that story and how you changed your mind? You know, well, the short version is that I grew up Southern Baptist and I, um, I was very much a devout Christian for my teenage years through my mid thirties. Um, I went into different kinds of ministry. I went to seminary, um, studied Bible, uh, went to a Baptist college and threw myself into um, preaching and teaching and um, non-traditional forms of ministry. But I was very into Bible study, very into learning about the New Testament world and loved theology. I loved staying up late talking to people about theological differences. Um, and But by the time I got to my mid-30s, I realized I didn't really have good reasons for believing the things I was taught to believe. I mean, I thought they were good for a long time, but I think the, the older I got, the higher my standard got for what I wanted to see to believe. Um, and I think I, I just got to the point where I realized that we're very, very good at fooling ourselves. Can you remember of looking back on it, and what are the things that were compelling to you at the time? Sure. An example would be that uh, the way that we approach prayer is really tricky. Um, I mean, by tricky, I mean that we play tricks on ourselves even. Okay. And it's a psychological game that you play. For example, you believe that God wants you to pray for a certain thing to happen. So you begin to pray, but you immediately um, begin couching your prayers in qualifications and in fine print that give God excuses for not actually doing the things you're asking him to do. And then over time, from disappointment, you learn to change your prayers to only pertain to things that you yourself can make happen. And so you're, you're basically playing a mind game with yourself. And you're, you're giving God this perfect scenario in which he or she or whatever never has to show up. But it never affects your faith either way. Because your faith is based on something that empirical observation can't touch you know, it's independent of what you actually see. And I think I stopped and saw myself doing that and said, wait a minute, I'm playing mind games with myself. You know, I'm, I'm making all of God's excuses for him ahead of time. You know, you couch it in qualifications like if it's your if it's your will, Lord, you know, or maybe instead what you want is to just teach me a lesson and you'll change nothing about my situation. So I realized I was actually doing that myself. I think that's what made me realize that um, it was a it was a trick, you know, that I'm playing on myself. That's one example. Um, I think another example would be the way that you uh, take contradictions in the Bible and you explain them away. Even if they're bad explanations, you just kind of learn to accept them because we're not supposed to know. You know, there's just, there's just things that we're not supposed to know the resolution of, and God's ways are higher than our ways, so nothing has to actually make sense. You know, and, and I think I realized at some point that if I was created in God's image and I'm supposed to look for explanations about the world around me, then why is it I keep having to shut that off every time I come upon something that doesn't make sense? And I'm just told, yes, use your God-given logic until it contradicts with something that the Bible says, and then you have to shut it down and say, his ways are higher than my ways. You yeah, know? how do you make that determination? When are you supposed to shut it off? Is it Whenever you reach a contradiction, that's when you're supposed to shut it off. Okay. You know? So I realized that that was cheating, and I was cheating, and I was even cheating at, I was cheating myself out of looking for good, good answers to the things that I was wondering. Aside from that, you know, I, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't the big questions of life, like why is there suffering in the world? You know, it wasn't because of tsunamis and things like that or because people I knew would die of cancer. I, I had explanations for that. You know, I had excuses for that, that God could, could get out of it. But I think the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I had been taught that God was a person that you're supposed to know in personal experience. You're supposed to be able to talk to God and God talks back to you. And I actually thought that God was doing that. You know, I, I, I think that I had an ongoing relationship for 20 years with a person. But at the end of that time, I realized that I have to make that person happen. You know, I have to provide both sides of the conversation. If at any point I lose the ability to believe that God is there, he goes away. And if you think about it, nothing else in life is that way where it doesn't even exist unless you believe it. I mean, we have a word for that. That's called the placebo effect. 
And for me, God was essentially like the ultimate placebo. It's this thing, it's this person that only has any effect on your life to whatever extent you can actually believe in it. But you have to believe first. Then you see the results, you know? So I realized that that was kind of cheating too. What was the catalyst that brought you uh, fully out? Was there, a, was there an epiphany moment or was it a gradual letting go? It was gradual. You know, really I wrestled with the same questions for 20 years or more. There really wasn't one thing that just was an aha moment. I think I think I just reached an age where I realized that life is too short to, uh, to to build your life around something that you're not relatively certain is real. And when I began to ask myself, what evidence do I have that what I believe is real outside my own head? I realized that there were very few things that I could point to. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, most of the things that I had as evidences for my faith were things that are inside your own head. Things like your own passions, your own feelings, your own desires. Um, most of my faith was worded in psychologically sophisticated ways that were almost impossible to disprove. So as before you were externalizing a lot of these things, you realized they were connected to you? Is that something? Oh, you know, the way, the way that faith works is you have to believe first and then you see. Okay. And I think I just realized that it was up to me to make those things real. And if I didn't make them real, they wouldn't be real. But there's a lot of things that are that way and they're not real, like Santa Claus, for example. He only comes if you believe in him. And if you quit believing in him, he stops showing up. Turns out it was just your parents. Well, I feel that way about God. I feel like it, I got to the point where I realized that all the things that I attributed to God were things that people do, you know? And we just labeled that God. And we got really good at labeling it God, but I just realized it was a superficial layer of meaning that wasn't really coming from reality. It's something we had to supply ourselves. Kind of an unnecessary middleman. Yeah, you know, Ryan Bell has a really good way of putting it. He just said, he, he finally realized that, that God is, a, is a, a layer of unnecessary complexity. That, that most people live their life making the same decisions and doing the same things whether they believe in a God or not. It's just that some were taught to use a God vocabulary as they come to it. But you both look both ways before crossing the street. You both know that you have to actually go to work if you want to make money. You can't just sit around and pray for things to come to you. You have to go out and do them. So for all practical purposes, uh, believers and non-believers live exactly the same way. It's just that the believers have the story that goes with it that the non-believers don't accept. They really actually make the same basic decisions from day to day. Mm -hmm. And I think I realized that about myself. I realized that for all practical purposes, I live as if there is no God. You know, I mean, the, 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 I still lock my doors, still have to go to work, still have to go to a doctor when you're sick. The Bible says you pray to get better. But everybody knows that if you just pray and that's it, and you don't go to the doctor, you're not going to get well. You know, so they say they believe in the power of prayer, but then after they pray, they go to the doctor. You know, and I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> this is another game that we play with ourselves. And we are actually making all the excuses for our religion, you know. That's, that started to dawn on me, but it took me to my mid-30s, and it was a very gradual realization. So you're a blogger on Patheos. It's called Godless in Dixie. Mm -hmm. but what are some of the topics that you talk about? I do a lot of unpacking of my deconversion. I talk about why it is that I changed my mind about God and about faith. Um, I talk a lot about what it's like living in the South as a skeptic, which makes me very countercultural. Um, even if outwardly I fit in just fine, um, I, I look at things very differently from most people here. And, and I feel it was necessary, especially after I was outed uh, as an atheist by other people, once I was already out, I realized that I might as well embrace it and run with it because too many people can't be out. They have to be closeted about their lack of belief. How did that feel being outed? Were these people that you had told in confidence that outed you, or no. was it something... Um, what happened was, students were stalking me on Facebook, and they saw that I had liked atheist pages. And I didn't know at the time that that, that was visible, so they confronted me in class, my students, and they asked me if I was an atheist, and I dodged the question, which was an answer to them. You know, I mean, every other teacher they have is very... Um, outspoken about their religion. So for me to dodge the question was pretty much an admission that I was an atheist. And then, you know, after I lost that teaching job at the end of the school year, I decided I was going to go on and start writing about um, about my own deconversion, not necessarily about the job or any of that. Okay. Um, and, and I started writing thinking that only a handful of people would even be reading it. 
but then more and more people started reading it and that got me even more out and before I knew it I was being asked to be on podcasts and shows and things and then once I appeared on the news and then I was on the news again and then people started recognizing me and I was definitely out at that point. Was there any point when you thought about hitting the brakes and backing up or attempting to try and back up? Um, no, because at, at that point, I pretty much had already lost everything I could lose. Um, my, my marriage didn't actually survive my deconversion. That was one of the things that uh, eventually didn't make it through that transition. Uh, my relationship with my daughters has, has survived just fine, and we have a really good relationship, but it really affected every other relationship. I mean, even the rest of my family, I lost a lot of friends, pretty much lost all my friends, actually, because it's not because they were shunning me, it's just because for them, church is their whole life. You know, I mean, most of the people that I was close to, their ministry is their whole life. They spend all their time thinking and talking about their church experience and their religion. So for me to not be inside of that, there's no connection left. At the very least, you wouldn't really have much common ground to talk about. It's like if you're fans of a sports team, right? And you exactly. no longer follow that sport, you're not going to have much to talk right. about. Right. And, so. and in this case, I actually wasn't into sports either, so I couldn't even use that. You know, and I live in Jackson, Mississippi. And if you're not into religion or sports or hunting, you're out of luck, you know? So uh, my, my connection with my friends was pretty much gone at that point. Um, and I, I realized that I, uh, I, I could even lose a teaching job from being an out atheist. And I had already lost the friends and had already had the, the family not survive the transition. And there's really not much left at that point. I mean, you've got nothing to lose. So why not go on and come out? Because the fact of the matter is I had plenty to say at that point. You know, there was a lot that I wanted to talk about, about what it's like being in my position. And I knew that there were people that were in a similar position who couldn't talk about it because they had not yet lost all those things. So I first began by talking about my own story, but before I knew it, everybody else was sending me their stories. And I was kind of feeding off of what they were saying and realizing that my experience is really similar to a whole lot of people who can't talk about it. And I created Godless and Dixie as a platform for sharing some of those perspectives. And what I've been hearing from all my friends has so um, informed the way that I approach these things that it, I think it's, it's a mouthpiece for a lot of people, whether people realize it or not. They think it's just me telling my stories, but it's not. I'm gleaning from everybody. One of the great things about blogging as opposed to just writing a book is the immediate feedback. And that's one of the things I love about writing. I mean, blogging itself is not innately prestigious. It's not like having a book that you've published through a legitimate publishing company. Uh, there's some selectivity there that, that brings a certain amount of honor and street cred with it. You know, anybody can blog. But the benefit of blogging is you get an immediate response from people. I mean, when you talk about the things that you're talking about, by the end of the day, you've got 30 people sharing stories with you. And, and a lot of times what happens is I didn't think of a good way to put something and somebody else gives me a better way to put it. And I, I absorb that. And the next time I come back to that topic, I'm going to have the benefit of all that discussion that happened on social media. It's not just on the blog itself, but it's in Facebook groups, it's on my personal wall, it's on the public Facebook page. There are people who are tweaking and informing and sort of honing my own explanation of these things. And they're giving me ways to talk about and think about these things that I wouldn't have come up with on my own. And that immediate feedback is hugely informative for what I'm doing, you know? Um, you talk about the, uh, the video, I think you were gonna ask about uh, where I sat down with the preacher. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. One of the so first... This was the, the interview an atheist at church day. Right. So Kyle Jones uh, was one of the organizers of that event back in 2013. And it was a national day for trying to create discussions between Christians and atheists in church. And it was called Interview an Atheist at Church Day. Um, Hemet Mehta put up a, a, um, a post about it and said anybody that would be interested in participating in this give Kyle Jones a call and fill out this form. And I didn't think anybody from Mississippi would take me up on it. I mean, I was eager to sit down with a, a pastor, a minister, whatever, talk about our differences of belief, but I didn't think there would be anybody who would, who would bite. But there was one guy, one guy in the whole state, and he was willing to sit down with me in front of his church and interview me and just ask me questions about, uh, you know, how I feel atheists are misunderstood by Christians. We weren't there to debate. You know, we weren't there to try to convince each other that the other one was wrong. And I certainly wasn't there to tell his church 
my reasons for not believing because that gets really close to debate. You know, I mean, the moment I go into here's all the reasons why I don't believe what you believe, then there's going to be people that would get offended, you know, and they would they would feel like they have to defend their faith. This was just an interview to sit down and talk about how do I want others to understand me better. And he was totally on the same page with that. So we did it for about 45 minutes. We sat down in front of his church and um, he asked me some questions and I answered them. I gave a list of 10 ways, 10 things that Christians, uh, that atheists wish Christians knew about them. Mm. Like for example, that um, we didn't all become atheists because something bad happened to us. Um, or for example, that when we say we don't believe in the devil, we really mean we don't believe in the devil. And they have a really hard time believing that. Um, and, and, and many of them believe that if we don't believe in God, it means that we, we really do believe in God. We're just mad at him. You know, things like that. Those are misconceptions that I don't think that anybody who actually is an atheist ever sat down and explained to them. You know, again, this is not me arguing for atheism. It's just saying, here's ways I think you misunderstand us. So I did that talk with them and it was very well received. I mean, in the room, they were very warm and welcoming. But then we put it up on YouTube and it got like 100, 120,000 hits or something. It was very popular. And, um, and it got circulated among people who didn't have a way to talk about those things with their family. That was the number one thing I was getting was people would send me these messages that said, I've been trying for two years to sit down with my family and talk about how I think they don't understand me, but I didn't have the words for it. So I showed them that video and we all sat down and we watched it together. The and video it, can be a surrogate for the things they couldn't do. Exactly. Because here was a picture of a guy and another guy. One's a Christian, one's an atheist, and they weren't mad at each other. They weren't arguing with each other. There was an obvious mutual respect between the two of them. And, um, and they, you know, we just demonstrated that you could actually sit down and have a civil discussion without it devolving into shouting matches and name calling. But we often say there's a difference between disagreement and disrespect. You know, you can um, disagree with a belief and an idea without disrespecting the person. And I think it helps to start there by trying to make that distinction. But many people who are very religious do have a hard time distinguishing those things. In fact, I think it was on, um, on the atheist experience, we had a Scottish gentleman call in named Hamish. And at one point we were, um, I think we were poking fun at the idea that the devil might have something to do with why the electronics weren't working right. And his response was, uh, don't mock my faith. And I said, well, you know, we weren't mocking you. We, weren't mocking you. We, were, we were poking fun at an idea. But of course, there is no separation between those two things for him. I mean, if you're going to poke fun at an idea that is very deeply held religious belief, they're going to take that personally because it's a part of their identity, you know? And, and I don't know that those two things can be separated. I think what's better is what Daniel Dennett said. He said, the best way to have a good conversation with somebody who believes things very differently from you is to first learn what they believe so well that you could state it as well as they could. And by the time you finish explaining what they believe in words that are just as good as they could, they end up saying, I don't think I could have put that better. Now their defenses are down and now you can have a real conversation because they feel understood. And I think that half of the problems that we have in these discussions is we keep having to stop and redefine terms because the other person isn't using words the same way that I'm using the words. And they're picking up on the little dog whistle languages that you're That's not picking up common. on. Yes. It is. You, there's, there's an encoding that happens. There's, there's loaded language that people use in church traditions. And if you're not from that tradition, you don't pick up on those nuances. So you try to have a conversation with them and the conversation is just shutting down because they don't feel understood by you. Which is why to me, the best way to uh, have conversations with theists is to first of all, know their view well enough that you won't keep misrepresenting it, you know? Um, which means that the atheist may have to do the harder work of learning that. I mean, I would love to find that the theist will do that for me as well. And, and I do find some friends that are that way. I have a few Christian friends who work so hard to understand why I believe what I believe that I don't feel that they misunderstand me. They disagree with my beliefs, but they but I feel understood by them. And I really treasure those relationships, you know? I, I look for those people and I try to collect them as friends. Well, that's respect. I mean, you're getting respect from, from them that, you know, they're value, valuing you as a human being enough to say, we may disagree, but I'm going to learn as much about this idea as possible right. so we can actually have a conversation. Right, so we have those conversations. And what I find is that when I'm with those people, we tend to get at nuances that we don't get from the conversations with people that we haven't taken the time to do that. 
and I feel like something comes out of that that's instructive, you know? I think there's constructive conversation that happens that way. And that, I want more of those, and whether it's through interview an atheist at church or through some other kind of emphasis that tries to get Christians and, and non-Christians together to talk about these things. We are in Vicksburg, Mississippi. This is one of the most important battlefields of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, having grown up in the area, uh, what sort of perspective have you learned that, uh, uh, between the relationship between uh, slavery, religion, and the war? There aren't many people today where I'm from who would go so far as to say that the Union winning was bad. You know, I, I think those people do exist, but they don't, they don't live near me. Let me put it that way. I think maybe you have to get farther out from the city to find folks to say that. What you hear instead is people trying to hold together two different ideas. One being that slavery was bad and needed to go away, um, and the southern economy was dependent upon it, so they didn't want to let go of it. But on the other hand, they continue to insist that there was this other political issue related to the rights of states. And so a lot of people uh, around here continue to say that they feel that, that there were states' rights issues as well as human rights issues. And they try to say that they're both there. And while they're willing to capitulate on the human rights issue, uh, they, they, won't, they won't argue that slavery needs to come back, although there are a handful of people that do that. Um, they, on the other hand, continue to say that they feel like states' rights were violated somehow. And it rears its head again when you talk about civil rights era of 100 years later. It was on a smaller scale, but Southerners fought the civil rights era tooth and nail because they thought that it was unjust. They believed that the federal government should not tell them who they should allow into their restaurants or drink from their water fountains or use their restrooms. You know, these, these things coming full circle uh, the idea that the federal government can't tell us uh, what human rights look like. We have to decide that for ourselves at the state level. That didn't go away. Okay. That's well, still I mean, I'll, I'll completely concede that it was about states' rights, but the states' right to own people. To own people, right. Right. <laughs> right. The, the problem is that it's, it's not that, there, that states' rights wasn't an issue. It's that it was superseded by a bigger issue, which was human rights. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why, during the civil rights era, the same thing happened. People believed that, hey, I own my private business. You can't tell me who I can serve and who I can't. But then the federal government said, yes, actually, we can. Because while we agree that you have a private business or you have a college that's run by your state and you feel that you can select who can come to your college and who can't based on their race, the reality is human rights trump your state rights. It's not that those don't exist. It's that something weighs more. There's something that's more important. And I don't think that people always get that nuance. And I think that's the same battle we're fighting now with uh, transgender rights, uh, gay and lesbian rights, marriage equality. We have people saying these should be states' rights issues. We should be allowed as states to decide what we do and what we don't do. Okay, well, where, where does religion come in? Because looking at the current debate about uh, transgender bathrooms, people who are allowed into the bathrooms, right. um, most of what I see comes from a religious right mm -hmm. corner. Right. Uh, and at the time, slavery was also justified by religion. Yes. Uh, the people that you know, how, how do they compare what's happening now, or is there a disconnect between... Because here, here we're... I think we're in agreement that it seems like it's a repeating pattern that yes. to any casual observer should be obvious that this is another manifestation of the same sorts of uh, arguments that have arisen in the past. Right. Well, it's very difficult to convince them of that um, because I think that the role that religion plays is subtle. I think that it's, it's subconscious. Um, I think the role that religion plays is it tends to... Um, it tends to validate tradition and, and it protects tradition in a way that makes you less willing to question it. So um, anything could be put into that tradition. It could be how you sing your hymns on Sunday morning or how you dress to go to church or it could be whether or not you're allowed to drink liquor on Sundays or whatever. Those traditions are holdovers from a different era. Um, ordinarily in a society those traditions can change with time but what religion does is it takes those traditions and it puts like a glass case over them 
and it says you can't touch these because they were given by God. And if they're given by God, now you can't discuss whether or not we need to keep them. You know, I mean, we can discuss whether some of our laws pertaining to speeding or some other things need to be changed based on changing times. But, but if something is validated by your religion, now you can't question it. So if your religion tells you, for example, that slavery is something that God might ordain under the right circumstances, then no one can convince you that there's any reason to get rid of it. Or if you believe that the separation of the races is something that God ordained, then mixing them back again would be a bad thing. And, and if you try to reason with people about why you think that it's fine, they would point to their Bibles and say, but look, it says here, and you can't question this because it's in the Bible. But I think that they tend to underestimate the influence their religion has on why they think the way they think. I was going to read you something from a post that I did a few months ago. Um, Frederick Douglass explained the role that religion played in the um, institution of slavery in the South. He said, revivals in religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. The church going bell and the auctioneer's bell chime in with each other. The pulpit and the auctioneer's block stand in the same neighborhood. We have men sold to build churches, women sold to support missionaries, and babies sold to buy Bibles and communion services for churches. Wow. That's because Frederick Douglass understood that religion and slavery went hand in hand. But if you ask people today to explain what role religion played in the preservation of slavery, evangelical Christians today will say, oh, no role at all. In fact, they'll argue that their faith, their religion, is what got rid of slavery. When in reality, what they're doing is they're borrowing from other cultures and other traditions. British evangelicalism was very different from American evangelicalism. And Wilbur, William Wilberforce was one of the religious um, you know, catalysts for change in America. But then so were also some secular activists as well. A lot of the abolitionists were non-religious in the United States. And if more often than not, the religious people in the United States were in favor of preserving slavery, not getting rid of it. And people today don't appreciate that enough because they look back through these kind of rose-colored glasses and they superimpose the way they feel about it now into the way people felt about it then. But in reality, the preachers in the pulpit were the ones who were keeping slavery alive. You know, I mean, they weren't the only ones, mm -hmm. but they validated it and they made it to where people were okay to leave it alone. What advice would you give to busy free thinkers, atheists that want to be active, but they don't feel like they have enough time? Hmm. Well, obviously time management would be a good thing, and I'm uh, not very good at that myself. Uh, obviously connecting with people that have the same passions that you do is a good place to start. Um, using social media in order to find people who care about some of the same things that you care about. People who have the same approach to these things that you do is a place to start, because they could kind of get you connected to some of those uh, whether it's organizations or whether it's events like conferences or whatever it is that you might benefit from and want to plug into. Um, that's where I would start is using social media. But I think I would also want to warn folks that, um, that they should always try to keep a balance because I think that there's something about living online that's not good for you. I think that what's happening is we're taking our lives and we're putting so much of it on the internet that the internet then bleeds into our personal life to where I, I can't wake up in the morning and just have a day. I wake up in the morning and there's internet drama and I have to deal with it. I feel and, you. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that that's actually not healthy. I think there has to be a better balance where we unplug and where we learn to give each other the space to not be there the moment you try to contact them. I think that we need to be more explicit about that and say, you know what, I want you to understand that if we're going to be friends, sometimes you're going to send me a message and it might be two days before I get back because I might be having a lot on my plate and I can't be expected to answer my phone every second of the day. I think we actually need to set up boundaries like that because what's gonna happen is people will get burnt out. And I think that happens a lot. I think that I've noticed that there's a big turnover, a rapid turnover within activism, within the atheist movement in general. I think that in, in people's effort to get involved in the larger movement, they need to make sure that they balance it with their daily personal life and with, with also finding a local community because I think that with a lot of us, we, we may not have many options. If you live in a small town in the middle of nowhere, you may not have anybody locally that you can connect with. And in that case, the internet is your lifeline. And you know, I don't blame folks for waking up in the morning and grabbing their phone first thing in the morning to connect with people that understand them. 
But at the same time, I think I think there's a need to unplug and to not let that become your whole life because it doesn't have any rhythm to it. The internet never sleeps, but people do. You know, I think I think we have to have these rhythms where we get off of the computer and we we put away the movement and we put away the activism and do something that's just right in front of us. That's not a big, huge, noble thing. That's about making your life worth everything. I mean, sometimes you just need to wake up in the morning and have a regular day. And I, I think what I would want to say to people who are wanting to be activists is to try to find that balance between a personal life and a public life. And and if one eats up the other, you're not going to be healthy, and you'll eventually burn out. Uh, are there any organizations here in uh, mid Mississippi? There is a Mississippi Humanist Association. Uh, some friends and I helped start that a couple of years ago. Um, it doesn't do a lot of big projects because there's not a lot of people involved. There's maybe about a dozen folks who belong, but um, but they're they're bound by a common desire to see humanism as as a, a label that people are familiar with in Mississippi. We have a Facebook group that's mostly closeted atheists, and there are about 600 of us uh, across the state, which is a nice big community. But we don't always get together because, like I said, most folks are closeted. But as far as national organizations are concerned, the, uh, the Mississippi Humanist Association is the only one that exists, pretty much. I mean, there are chapters of humanism down on the coast, and there used to be one up in northeast Mississippi, but there's really not much of a presence. And some of the other national organizations, like the United Coalition of Reason or American Atheists, uh, they don't have chapters in Mississippi because it's really difficult to even advertise. You know, you can't even buy advertising space on the billboards because they're owned by Christians. And they will not let an American atheist billboard in Jackson, Mississippi. It's just not going to happen. Maybe one day it will, but uh, there's just such a strong aversion to it that most of the people who are atheists in Mississippi can't openly talk about it, which means they also can't join an organization that's public. You know, I mean, if they, if they join a Facebook group that's public or they go to a meeting of the Mississippi Humanist, people are going to ask questions. We have people who are worried that they'll lose their jobs. You know, that it could it could disrupt their families if they're open about their atheism. So these are real concerns. It makes it hard to get a groundswell in a place like this. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Um, I want to write at least one book, maybe two or three. I want to take some of what I've already written on the blog and put it together into a publishable volume or two. Um, I'd like to continue engendering more conversations with theists, you know, maybe even getting involved in more churches. Um, I was on a podcast with a Christian not too long ago, one of the creators of VeggieTales, in fact. And um, one of his co-hosts co suggested that um, I ought to go into consulting business for churches. And my first thought was, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I mean, why would they want me? And he said, well, because they're, they're hemorrhaging membership. And maybe what they need is to have somebody come in who can explain to them why they're losing so many people. I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I don't know that's ever going to fly. I don't know that churches would be willing to turn over their you know, leadership to conversations with an atheist, but it's an intriguing idea anyway. And um, you know, maybe if they're desperate enough. But whatever it would take to get more conversations with people on the other side of the aisle, I appreciate that and I like doing that. Um, I'm gonna be raising kids, you know? I mean, it takes a lot of my time. I might be doing some more teaching. I'll be doing a lot more writing. And other than that, just trying to figure out where my place is in all of this, you know? Thank you, Neil, for talking with me. My pleasure.